good morning, everyone. So for the day, second day of our workshop, I'd like to take advantage to make a few remarks. Uh, if you have not submitted your poll for the breakout session, please do so. Uh, we have received many of them, but maybe not all. And uh, Kurosh will send you anytime now by email the link for the, the survey uh, that we need uh, to ask you to fill. It's a request by NSF, but more importantly, it's uh, an excellent feedback for us to help us to, to improve our workshop in, in, in the future, especially this time, it's the first one that is online. So we would really appreciate your feedback. And I think now we will move to the today's agenda. So the, the, the first topic today is to show you a short virtual walkthrough of the construction site of the LH post six. Uh, since when we do the workshop in person, you know, we, we go there and, and people uh, usually enjoy the tour to see the real thing. So we try to, with Kurosh, walk a, a, a around the construction site and give you a feel for what is going on and what has already been built and what still needs to be done. So Kurosh, I think at this point you can start playing the, the video. Absolutely. Hello, I am Joel Conte, professor of structural engineering at UC San Diego and in charge of the upgrade of uh, our large outdoor shake table. So I would like to give you a tour of uh, the, the upgrade, construction side of the upgrade and, and focus on some important points. So let's go. So here we are at the Engelkirk Structural Engineering Center. We are arriving, we are pointing uh, west you can see here a large tent. We had to uh, build these tents to, to store a lot of uh, equipment, several hydraulic equipment mainly, uh, since uh, the upgrade is taking uh, quite some time. It started, uh, the project of the upgrade started on October 1st, 2018, and will end in uh, late spring, summer 2021. Here you, you see a uh, the safety towers that we use when we are testing some specimen to prevent them from collapsing. All right, and here we are turning uh, towards our staging slab. Uh, we had a, a second tent earlier here on that slab as well, but now you can see these two big packages uh, that contains actually the two new horizontal actuators. Now we are walking back towards towards the shake table and you start to see the platen of the shake table that is resting on four large uh, reinforced concrete columns that were built just for the temporary storage of the platen. The platen weighs about 145 ton and it will require some work, we re require some drilling of uh, many holes to install the new wear plates underneath and uh, we have to do some machining on the underside of the platen to provide uh, ideal surfaces to slide over the, the vertical actuators. And as we turn south, you can see the hydraulic power building. It's the same building that we had the last 15 years. It contains all the hydraulic power supply and the controller of the table. So we are going to have an overall look at the, the inside the reaction map. So you see a number of things here, a lot of piping. And the red pipes is the one that will have the pressure, the main pressure pipes. The red pipes, if you follow them, they, they follow a ring. We call this the main pressure ring. And the blue pipe are the return pipes. During, when the shake table will be, will be working, the fluid inside the red pipe will be at 3000 PSI. Inside the blue pipe, the return will be probably below 100 PSI. You see, the, these are gigantic pipes. They have a 12 inch diameter in, in, uh, inside diameter. They are one and a quarter inch thick. You also see a lot of smaller pipes. The smaller pipes, you see red, blue, and yellow. So these are the pilot, the, the, the red and the blue are the pilot pilot pressure red, pilot return blue, 
and the yellow one are the drain pipes. I'd like you to observe you know, these two walls that each of them support three vertical actuators. You, st you see the steel base plate that will support the actuators. You notice that the plate that are at the end of each of the wall, so four of these plates, they had to be extended because in the 6 degree freedom upgrade, the four corner vertical actuators have to be moved in by a 10 inch to accommodate the new kinematic capabilities of the platen. So here you, you see the, the platen, you see these two large steel plates that will receive the head of the horizontal actuators. In the 1 degree freedom configuration, they used to be fixed here. And now in the 6 degree freedom configuration, there will be one horizontal actuators fixed here and the other one connected here. We are going to go under the platen to show you surfaces over which the vertical, uh, over which the vertical actuator will slide the top of the vertical actuator. So you see these surfaces, they, they, they had rusted in the last 15 years. We just grit blasted these areas. And you see the one in the middle here. So there is three on each side. We are going to install some very large wear plates, half inch thick wear plates, highly polished. And we have some, we will uh, have to maintain a planarity of plus or minus 24 thousandths of an inch of each of these six areas. Now under the platen here you can see two very large, uh, the, the two large saddle blocks that will allow to anchor the top of the hold down strut. Right? And we have, we will have a new one in the middle. You can see that uh, the one in the middle has never been used in yellow here. And then at the other end of the platen the, there is the, the existing one. So we will have three hold down strut to, uh, to keep a very, a very large overturning moment capacity. Here I would like to show you the northwest corner of the reaction mass of the shake table. You can see here that we are in the process of post tensioning the large steel plate that serve as a base for the horizontal actuators that I'll show you in a second inside the reaction mass. But you can see here six post tensioning rods with the nuts and, and the plates washers. And you also see that we have grouted uh, the, the, the volume be behind the, the plates, between the plates and the, the reaction wall. And now we're going to go and look at these large steel plates that are inside the reaction mass. So you see one of them here that has been positioned. Uh, it has, uh, now what needs to happen is it, uh, we need to do some surveying work to have all the accuracy in the final positioning and then grout the spacing between these plates and the reaction mass. And we have four of those because now we're going to have four horizontal actuators. You can see the location of the other two uh, that, we'll, that we will work on very soon. And now we are going to go inside the building, see a, a number of things. We are going to look at, uh, we have two new pumps to supplement the existing 2-1. And we're going to look at the new accumulator bank that is completely installed and a lot of the new piping inside the building. So let's go. All right, so here we are turning around the west-south corner of the hydraulic power building. And you will see, you will see the two new pumps, brand new pumps that are being added to the existing two, two pumps. And you can see that we had to, of course, connect them to the cooling system. We have a new cooling tower. You see the brown pipes there for the cooling system and, and also bring the electrical power here. And now we are going to see next to this the, the brand new accumulator bank, very large accumulator bank, 75 bottles with a total volume of 10,000 gallon. So here you see the they are in a group of five bottles. So we have 15 of these sub-modules. You can see that every bottle is monitored for the pressure uh, with wireless pressure sensors. And this is basically these two pumps that you have seen. They are going to be used to mainly pressurize the accumulator bank, to, to push some oil at the base of each of the bottom 
below the piston until the nitrogen pressure, which is above the piston, reaches a pressure of 5,000 psi. In the idle conditions, the pressure of the nitrogen in, in the bottle is 3,000 psi. So about 20-25% about of the bottom of each bottle will be filled by oil. And that, that pressurized oil is the one that is used to control the horizontal and vertical actuators when we reproduce uh, a uh, multi-dimensional earthquake ground motion. And here below the catwalk, you can see clearly some red pipes. So the, the pressurized oil that is inside the accumulator bank is released through some blowdown valve released into these red pipes, pressure pipes, that, that connect to the one that we have seen inside the reaction mass. And you also see uh, here the blue pipes and that's the return pipe and you can see that they return the fluid at low pressure all the way to the surge tank. You see this large surge tank, we did not have to change it. Uh, we had sized it properly uh, 15 years ago, thinking about the upgrade. All right, so now let's go and look at the, the cooling tower. We had to completely replace the old cooling tower that was uh, close to the end of its life. Number one and number two uh, didn't have the cooling power required for the, for the upgraded shake table. So behind me, you see the cooling tower for the four powerful pumps that we have in the system. You see a lot of uh, circuitry here, a lot of pipe for the water and the electrical system uh, support the cooling tower. Look at the size of the cooling tower compared to the building. It's pretty appreciable. We're going to go on the other side now. So here you see the, the two blue tanks here. It contains chemical that prevent calcification inside the heat exchangers of the pumps. This is a problem that we experienced in the past and we, we don't want this to, to happen in the future again. So let's go inside the building. So here we have a very good view of first, uh, you see the two existing pumps. So one of them is going to continue to serve as the pump that is feeding the, all the pilot flows to control the spool of the servo valves. And the second pump will be also used to pressurize the accumulator bank. So we will have three pumps to pressurize the accumulator bank now. You see the top of the accumulator bank. Again, these, these modules of five bottles each, 15 modules, 75 bottles. You can see the, again, the surge tank here. It's a 20,000 uh, liter surge tank. So now we are going to go downstairs and go all the way to the bottom of the building to appreciate the size of the accumulator bank from the, their footing and the surge tank and also follow the path of the oil from the, surge, from, from the accumulator bank all the way to uh, the reaction mass. So now here you see the incredible height of this new accumulator bank and again the surge tank from, from below and you see the, the two uh, pressure pipes. Uh, mo uh, most of these pressure pipes were prefabricated uh, by GS Hydro in Houston. Uh, one link that had to be welded in the site here is the one that I'm showing you here. So you see these one, two, three, and four uh, big weld, circular weld. The same thing for the second pipe in the back. These took a long time and they had to be x-rayed uh, as all the other weld. And uh, these are again huge pipe, 12 inch diameter inside, one and a quarter inch thickness. So you see uh, again there, they are coming out of the between the two accumulator banks here which release the oil through some blowdown valve that we can see here in the view of the camera uh, with the one degree of freedom configuration we used to have only one of these pressure pipes and we had to double it so now we are going to enter the tunnel and you can see below these two red pipes there are also two blue pipes that are the return pipes 
you see that the tunnel is now uh, occupied hugely by, by these uh, large pipes. Now we are entering, we are entering the, the reaction mass. You can see here the joint of the foundation of the building and, and uh, the reaction mass. So we're on the south side of the reaction mass with a tunnel that brings the one pressure pipe and one return pipe towards the east and then on the other side towards the west. Now we are inside the reaction mass. We have, it, we have seen it a few minutes ago from above. So now you can see the big wall, the large wall here that is supporting three of the vertical actuators. You can also see the steel base plate that will support the vertical actuators. As I explained earlier, uh, four of them had to be extended. You can see the extension here uh, with rebars welded to the plate and anchored down to the concrete. We still need to, to grout this. We had to do this because the vertical actuator now in their new position will be 10 inch more on the inside than before to accommodate the schematic capabilities of the, the platen with the new actu horizontal actuators. You can see here many of these large blocks called hydraulic manifolds and at the bottom again you can see now uh, closer than before you know again the red and the blue pipes but you can see these large blocks with three four five six eight sixteen each of them has sixteen uh, orifice and these will allow flexible holes to bring the high pressure fluids to the servo valve of the horizontal actuators and get the, and get the return and you can see here again from very close one of the gigantic uh, steel plate that to which the horizontal actuator will be anchored. So the, the swivel base of the new horizontal actuator will be, will be bolted to these two, two plates protruding out. But you can see here, this plate has not been grouted yet. Uh, very, very shortly, in the next week or so, we will, we will grout them against the reaction mass after a very accurate positioning. I'd like to bring to your attention, you see this opening into the reaction mass, first of all, the tunnel through which we came, and then you, you have the, the door on the west here, the door on the north, and the other door towards the east. Uh, this reaction mass has tunnel inside. It's not a solid block of concrete. Also, would like to show you this middle area between the two large walls supporting the, the vertical actuators. You can see these uh, catwalks, and so, we are going to replace the two uh, hold down strut that were here in the last 15 years. You can see here on the video the, the saddle, one of the two saddles that is anchoring the base of the hold down strut to the bottom of the reaction mass. We will need to bring a third hold down strut that has already arrived. You can see, you can see it here. Under the blue tarps, we have the two existing. Uh, hold down strut and under the, the brown tarp we have the brand new one that has arrived on site a few uh, months ago and now that third one will be anchored down in the same way as the other two in the middle to, to, to increase the overturning capacity of, of the sh shake table platen. So this concludes our virtual tour of uh, the construction site of the upgrade of the LH post to six degree freedom. We will call the facility the LH post six. Uh, we are right now on course to reopen the facility in July 2021. Uh, very sorry that you could not be here in person. It would have been nicer. Uh, we hope that uh, you will have a chance to, to come soon before it reopens or, or soon after it reopens. Thank you very much for your attention. All right, so hopefully this could give you a, a real feel of the, the construction site. So in the interest of time, maybe let's go now uh, directly to the, the next item on, on the agenda, which is the fifth uh, keynote presentation by uh, Bill Holmes. Let me introduce him briefly when he gets set up. So Bill Holmes is 
very well known. He, he worked as a structural engineer for Rutherford Rather Ford and Check-In in San Francisco for 45 years before retiring in 2010. He's still very active as a, as a senior technical advisor for, for the firm. Uh, he has been engaged on many projects with the Applied Technology Council over the last 20 years, most recently being the technical lead on ATC 78, seismic evaluation of all the concrete buildings for collapse potential. He's also a member of the strategic committee of the NERI National Coordinating Office at Purdue, serving as the chair of the technology uh, transfer committee. So he's a, he's a national authority on seismic code and design issues. He's a member of the National Academy of Engineering. Among many significant awards, he was awarded the Alfred Alquist Medal for Achievement in Earthquake Safety by the California Earthquake Safety Foundation and the Brunier Award for Lifetime Achievement in Structural Engineering by the Structural Engineers Association of Northern California. So thank you very much, Bill, for participating to our workshop. And we look forward to your presentation. I don't know if you can uh, hear us, Bill. Okay, how about now? Oh, great. great. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Too many, too many mute buttons here. Um, <laughs> Thank you for uh, inviting me to, uh, to your workshop, uh, and uh, I hope I can uh, give particularly young researchers uh, some, some ideas here. Uh, UC San Diego it certainly uh, does not need any lectures about technology transfer. They have long, that's been long a high priority, including having review boards and consultants, uh, engineering consultants on your, on your research. So uh, the Technology Transfer Committee is, is really mainly directed at, at younger researchers that uh, maybe don't understand the process and uh, need some tips. Um, if you're, if you're pre-planning a project, obviously uh, research that has been already noted by the industry or standards as something that is needed, that kind of research is certainly going to be uh, more easily implemented. Uh, so there's, the question is, how do you find that? Well, I guess the science plan that NERI has produced was sent out to you. It is intended to be very comprehensive regarding a mitigation of risks or improving resilience related to all the, the natural hazards covered by NERI. And of course, that includes uh, high winds, uh, tsunami, storm surge, and, and earthquake. Um, I'm going to concentrate mainly on seismic because that, this site uh, certainly has that uh, focus. What are some other sources, perhaps, uh, that you could get ideas? Uh, all, the, all the hazards have uh, research plans of one sort or another. There's some links here that I think you're going to get the slides, so when you get the slides, you can use these links. Uh, to get this various documentation that I'm, uh, that I'm going to show. But in the wind, there is a, a National Windstorm Impact Reduction Program that has a strategic plan. That program is run out of uh, NIST, and so, so there, is a, there is a similar thing to the science plan, uh, only focused on wind. The tsunami also has a, <clears throat> a research plan uh, produced by NSF and NOAA, and he got a link there. And then lastly, uh, there is a future issues and research needs document that is now available on the Building Seismic Safety Council website. And there's a link there. I'll talk about this document uh, a little bit more uh, and the uh, NERP provisions that's produced by the uh, Building Seismic Safety Council. So let's talk a little bit more about specific about seismic. The, the NERP provisions uh, is cr created every five years, <clears throat> and it's a feeder to the seismic provisions of ASC 7. And the seismic provisions of ASC 7, that's a loading document. That's uh, pretty much required by the codes. So in a way that when you produce the NERP provisions, it's, <clears throat> it's directly related to going eventually into the IBC. Only it goes through ASC 7 uh, first. 
<clears throat> and her provision is made up of 25 or 30 uh, individuals uh, funded by FEMA. The travel is, of course, the, the, the work is all voluntary. So uh, it's, it's really the best place to get seismic research implemented because it's supposed to be far uh, future thinking. Uh, uh, and so new ideas and concepts <clears throat> should go through uh, the NERP provisions before it gets to ASC 7. So at the end of every cycle, five-year cycle, several documents are published uh, as part of the NERP provisions. Um, the late, we just finished the cycle, so the latest version will be pu published actually probably within the next month or two. And it, <clears throat> the NERP provisions is made up of three parts. Part one is the actual changes that are proposed to be made in ASE 7 um, that that have been voted on over the uh, five-year cycle. And then with every change, of course, there's a commentary to that change. So uh, part two of the NERP provisions is, in fact, the commentary that was related to those changes. And then part three uh, is maybe not so familiar to people. Uh, it's called the research resource papers. And it documents work that's been done by committee members that for one reason or another it did not get in, into a proposal. So in order not to lose that work, uh, this part three was created. And because it's, again, future thinking, uh, it, those resource papers could contain, you know, ideas for, for research that is needed. And then lastly, there's this future issues and research needs document which I'll also talk about a little bit more, <clears throat> that is created by the members of the Provisions Update Committee at the end of every cycle, which documents issues that they've seen come up within the provisions over the last five years and, and research that might be needed in order to solve some of those problems. So the resource paper document this uh, particular cycle is quite long. And these are the subjects of the uh, resource paper. You can see it, it's quite buried. Uh, there's concerns about the current mapping, uh, the risk-based basis of the current mapping. There were several members that had sort of a minority opinion, so they have, have written about that. Of course, resilience-based design it is a big concern because it would seem to be uh, obvious that eventually something like that is going to have to get in the code, and uh, what is that going to look like? So there is a paper discussing that. It's a pretty comprehensive pa paper discussing what we know about shear walls and lateral earth pressure and so on. You can see these different subjects, a lot of concerns about uh, diaphragms and lack of uh, testing on certain kinds of diaphragms. Uh, so there, there's probably some uh, good suggestions for research needs uh, in those uh, papers. Now that the other document, the future issues and research needs, is uh, here is the <clears throat> the website for that uh, document, and some some highlights. I, certainly not all of the things that are discussed in there. I'm not sh showing here, but some of the highlights is again there. The, the concern about functional recovery and uh, parallel sort of design criteria for essential buildings to make sure those buildings <clears throat> will stay operational uh, after an event. Uh, we really haven't had a lot of uh, experience with such buildings other than the base isolated ones, so it's really not known whether our designed simply with an importance factor of one and a half, what that's going to do. There's a lot of concern about that. Uh, another thing which is pertinent to UC San Diego <coughs> is that there's a lot of uh, interest in rocking structures, and there's really no design guidance of enough detail that would go into a code. So that is highlighted <coughs> in this uh, future issues and research needs. There are concerns about the vertical component of ground motion, and uh, that yet is another subject that would that, that could take advantage of the new table uh, in combination of the vertical component and the uh, horizontal components. 
And Joel was talking about also there's a, a, a twisting motion that is of concern. That, that concern many years ago created the accidental torsion part of the code, and that's been controversial, uh, whether it's big enough or whether it's needed at all. So <clears throat> that twisting uh, capability of the table might, might be very useful for that issue. Uh, there's a lot of also concerns about duration of ground motion, and certainly in the in the northwest, uh, whether our provisions now, which are considering the large earthquakes, but California style, uh, certainly not as long as uh, we're expecting. And there's always problems with the design of non-structural components. The, this cycle, the forcing functions of the non-structural. Uh, world ha ha were completely redone. Uh, a lot of uh, work done by ATC to produce uh, that ch uh, change, but there's always a concern that is our implementation uh, good enough, and it seems like most earthquakes show us that there's always a lot of damage to non-structural components, so that that's always a concern. And interesting uh, the most common diaphragm that we have, a cast on place diaphragm, is actually not tested very much, uh, mainly because I guess everyone thought that it, 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 it is solid. But uh, in order to, to make, put it on an equal basis with other diaphragms that have been tested, uh, this future issues and research needs document is calling for some tests of cast in place concrete diaphragms. And finally, uh, there's been some studies that show that the non-structural finishes of uh, stud-framed buildings, uh, steel and wood, uh, that has a lot of uh, uh, sheetrock and plaster finishes that are quite strong and stiff, are, are uh, interacting with the shear walls and uh, might give us uh, unexpected uh, results. And this is both good and bad because uh, the tests are computational tests show that uh, it helps and the buildings are much stronger than we expect, but on the other hand, it can create a weak story at the ground level because these walls are typically the same on every floor, so you finally get down to the first level and uh, it, it will become a weak story. There are many other uh, ideas and needs. Uh, I just picked out some. The other assistance for implementation comes from our committee. Actually, we, that's why we were created. Uh, we have made one sweeping view of, of all review of all of research, NERI research. We're about ready to embark on another sweep uh, of the research been done in the last couple of years. But we we have other uh, programs, so to speak. Uh, this is a little flyer here, which I know you can't read, but you can probably read it when you get the copy uh, of the slides. <clears throat> but this basically is advertising the Technology Transfer Committee, and it's sort of aimed at young researchers. And th th this committee is about 20 volunteer uh, people th who are knowledgeable about technology transfer in all of the hazards, tsunami, wind, storm surge, and, and seismic. So we have we have sort of experts in all those areas on the committee that that could help uh, with the implementation. Uh, there's a lot of implementation ideas that are uh, that are documented in in, in another uh, paper that we've written, um, and <clears throat> we're actually also offering brief uh, uh, conversations between young researcher or any researcher as far as that goes with the technology transfer committee or a member of it to discuss, uh, and I'm, I'm talking about maybe an hour or two, but to discuss implementation and what, what, how the research might be changed in some way or refined to make it more implementable. So that flyer it, uh, is available. Uh, there's also uh, one of the major efforts was a paper that we've written on the mechanisms for implementation of NERI research results. And this, this paper took a long time and is quite comprehensive. Um, it goes over the common methods for implementing research results, uh, specifically in the, the hazards area. And it, 
there's also uh, some of the members felt that researchers could frame their results in ways that make it more readily implementable because sometimes you get the research results and there, there is some intermediate step that has to be taken by somebody or some group that <clears throat> translates the research results into more code, code type information. So th those steps are sort of documented in there. Uh, there's an overview of how the existing codes and standards work. Um, it's, it's a mystery to students, I know. It's kind of a complicated uh, world. Uh, and in the seismic world, as I mentioned, you, it goes from the NERP provisions to ASC 7, finally to the IBC or the IRC. Uh, and, and we're also discussed besides ASC uh, 7, we discuss ASC SEI 41, which is the uh, code, you might call it, the standard for existing buildings. We also give an overview of research implementation and te technology transfer programs of major federal organizations that everyone's heard about, such as FEMA, NIST, and then private organizations such as ATC and BSSC. The NERP provisions is actually uh, organized uh, by BSSC with funding from FEMA. We also give some information on privately funded entities that have technology transfer activities. Uh, there's quite a, there's a number of these related to uh, house construction. Uh, and there's also discussion about early adopters. An early adopter in this sense is, is most likely an engineering company that <clears throat> knows of some research results somewhere that aren't, is not in the code yet but feels that it, this information could improve their designs. So they use it uh, before it gets in the code. This particular uh, uh, method sometimes runs into trouble with local building departments, but engineers uh, can often, through peer review or uh, other, other methods, get their designs approved by early adopters. So if if a research has uh, engineers or a panel or a consultant from industry uh, on their, their team, so to speak, or reviewing their research all the time, those p engineers are the ones that are likely to be early adopters because they would be very familiar with the, the results. There's also some special issues when, you, when a research ends up developing proprietary materials, design methods, or construction methods. And we discussed that briefly as well as, as to how the, the differences of implementation when there's proprietary uh, uh, information developed. And lastly, uh, we emphasize that pr presentations of, of all kinds are useful and necessary because Nothing is ever going to get implemented unless somebody knows about it. So it's, it's needed to, uh, to give presentations on an ongoing basis about the research and the results uh, so that the code uh, or, or other people are going to implement it know, know about these uh, results. <clears throat> the, the paper also stresses what I mentioned it to start that the industry involvement in research on an ongoing basis is very useful. And I know from personal experience that UC San Diego does this uh, very successfully and has uh, review boards and committees that are overviewing their research and making suggestions on, on uh, how to make it uh, more useful. So this particular paper uh, is also available with this somewhat long, uh, crazy uh, link, but that came that was assigned by Design Safe, so I have nothing I can do about that. But you can get that paper uh, from that from that link, and uh, I hope that the young researchers will avail themselves of that uh, of that paper because I think it has a lot of useful information uh, for. Uh, the young researchers. So thank you for uh, inviting me and I hope this was useful.
Yes, thank you very much, Bill, for a very informative presentation, uh, very useful for uh, young researchers in particular. So do we have any question from the audience uh, for Bill Holmes? Okay, so there seems to be no question right now. Okay, good. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bill, again, for your excellent presentation. So we will now proceed with uh, the next item on the agenda, which is an introduction to the breakout session. So let me see if I can show my screen again. I interject really quick uh, while you're doing that. Sorry, this is Kurosh. Um, if everyone can please send me uh, a chat or a private chat so we don't fill up the entire chat with uh, your top choice for the breakout sessions that we're going to be starting shortly. Um, we're trying to pre-assign people to their correct rooms and it would really help out. Thank you. All right. So we are going to, uh, let me see the time. So we are nine o'clock. So we are right on time. So this is now the introduction to the breakout session. Then we will have the breakout session. There are 10 groups from 9.15 to 11, and then a break of 15 minutes, and then we come back to the general session. So here again, uh, we mentioned that yesterday already, but we sharpened them a little bit yesterday afternoon. So the breakout session objective, uh, you can see here five main objective, identify high priority, grand challenge, research needs in earthquake engineering. So knowledge, knowledge gaps that could be addressed with using the, the LH post with six degrees of freedom brainstorm on some example uses of the facility to tackle some of these grand challenges and then help us you know shape the future research programs and operations at uh, by utilizing the unique capabilities of the LH post 6 mainly to improve the seismic resilience of the built environment and also suggest identify possible mechanisms you know, to, to, to develop collaborations between industry professionals and academy, academicians in, the very, in structural and geotechnical earthquake engineering. Number four here, uh, explore how the LH post six facility can support industry projects. And then five, in, in, in which way the LH post six can fulfill the unique opportunity, I think, now to change, like we mentioned yesterday, the nature of seismic testing in the US and, and worldwide. So these are the, the, the 10 sessions that uh, we have organized. And they, we had polled you know, the people who registered to the workshop early on to shape up these 10, 10 sessions here. So those of you like Kurosh mentioned who have not uh, responded to the poll yet, please do so. But right now we have a pretty good distribution of people who chose this session as their first choice. We have uh, eight here, seven on number two, four, number three, 11, the largest one, seismic retrofitting of building structures, bridge structures, five, earthquake protective system, uh, nine, geostructures, nine, lifeline nine as well, non-structural component and system five and seismic qualification of equipment four. So in each session we're going to have, we have a, a moderator who has generously accepted to do the job and, and a scribe. So you if I may ask, ask yes. sorry to interrupt you, I'm sorry, can we keep this slide up on the screen for maybe one more minute just so sure. everyone can see the list as well? Thank you. Sure. So the scribe up all PhD students from our department 
at various stages of their PhDs. You see here the name of the moderators. So the breakout session instructions that we send to the moderator and the scribes to develop a consensus on the three highest priority test program within your, your session area that can be addressed with the LH post six. And we, we have a number of suggested questions here, but you can of course add more. What type of specimen are ideal for accomplishing your research priorities? What resources are needed? How can the site help? Would hybrid testing help solve your problems? Would the reconfigurable test frame that we showed yesterday be useful in conducting your research program? And we have already in the last few months talked about a universal base frame that at some point will be needed. Uh, you have seen the new capabilities of the LH post six. We cannot, you know, it's hard to resist comparing against the E-Defense. You know, you, some of you may already have done this. We have many parameters that exceed the E-Defense. We have pay maximum payload capacity of 2,000 ton. The E-Defense has 1,300 ton. They have a maximum displacement, displacement of one meter. We are now going to 89 centimeters. Uh, we exceed their, their peak velocity uh, and so on, but they have a very large uh, platen. Uh, forgot the exact dimension. Uh, much, much larger than, than ours. But you have seen on some tests that Professor Estrepo, for example, showed yesterday, we, in the past, we have used outriggers to extend you know, the size, the footprint of the specimen that we can test. So soon there will be a, uh, we, we'll, we'll try to organize a workshop on and invite the community to, for whether there is really a need for and, and if, if, if this is agreed on, how should we design you know, a universal base frame that extends the footprint of the platen? So if you could also discuss that, that would be great. And then identify any impediments for advancing your ideas. Of course, cost is always an obvious one, but imagine that the sky is the limit. And maybe some logistics that maybe I will refer to to you, Kurosh, I think you want to give some information about the breakout? Yes, please, thank you. Thank you very, very much. This is Kurosh again, everyone. Um, so we are currently in the process of assigning everyone to their appropriate breakout rooms uh, according to our polling results. Uh, once again, I'll reiterate, if you haven't already submitted the poll, if you submitted the poll, then you're fine. We'll, we'll take your information from the polls, but if you haven't, please send me a private chat. Uh, through the Zoom chat feature, and uh, we will assign you to your, your preferred breakout room. Once we start the breakout rooms after the break, um, you're going to get a little pop-up that's going to show up on your screen, and it's going to say, you know, you've been assigned to this breakout room, and you can just click the Join button, and it'll put you inside that room. Once you're in there, you'll have the option to unmute yourself if you want to turn on your webcam, if you want to, you know, share some slides. You will have those options within your breakout rooms. Now, when the breakout room sessions are ending, you will get a notification on your screen. Um, it'll give you 60 seconds, a heads up saying, you know, we're closing out these rooms, so wrap up whatever, you're, whatever discussions you're having and be prepared to leave. When you're done with the breakout rooms, it's gonna bring you automatically right back to the main room. So you don't have to, you know, click on any links or anything. If you choose to leave the breakout room at any time, you can go ahead and leave it and it'll bring you back to the main room, but you'll just be sitting there in a main room. Uh, there's nothing happening there. That's where you know, you'll know you just be. If you have any difficulties, if you get kicked off or if you try to log back in and it, you won't get put in your correct room, please contact me either through the chat feature if you're already in the Zoom through Zoom or just shoot me an email. My email's on the screen right now and you should all have it by now. Um, I'm checking my emails regularly, so I'll be available to help out with any problems. Yeah, that's about it. Thank you very much, Kurosh. And I forgot to mention, yeah, here on the first bullet. So the one of the tasks of the moderator after the discussions and so on would be to meet with the scribe who will take notes all along and prepare one or two slide maximum PowerPoint with the 
you know, summarizing the main, the main key ideas that are in the second bullet here and presenting it back to the, to the main session. And I'd like to insist on this because there are 10 groups. So even five minutes each would be too much because we would like to leave as much time for, for a good discussion after these, uh, re, you know, these summaries come back. So if you could really try to stick to the three minute presentation, so basically one or two slides, we would really appreciate so that we have enough time for discussion. So I think based on that, we can go to the breakout session unless there are questions. Let's see if there are some questions or... Well, we're still um, assigning the rooms, so it might take a few minutes. So please feel free to ask your questions at this point. Joel, this is John. Uh, just yes. Um, I'm wondering, is it possible? I don't know if that can be changed, but instead of a 60 second warning, could could it be like a five minute warning, just uh, also, or is that possible, um, or is that like a setting? And if that's a setting in Zoom, don't worry about it. But I'm just thinking, uh, 60 seconds, we might go into a panic. <laughs> the, the warning maximum could be 120 seconds. Unfortunately. Okay, we'll take it. We'll take 120. <laughs> <laughs> Good job, John. <laughs> okay. Great. And as uh, we are waiting for, for you to be sent to the breakout session again, those of you who joined a little bit later, uh, we would appreciate very much if you can fill the survey that was sent to you that again is requested by the National Science Foundation when we organize workshop, but also provide us with great feedback in, on how to improve our future workshops, especially if they continue to be online for some time. Well, has the survey been sent already or was it to be sent at the end of the session today? I sent it earlier this morning. Oh, okay, excuse me, yes. pardon me. Yeah. I encourage you to ask questions now that if you have not understood something regarding the breakout session. Have the scribes been given the template slides? Yes. Yes, yes they have. Okay. 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 We, we, last night, we, if you are a moderator or a scribe, you should have received an email from us last night with the, with the slides, the set of slides that will help you in your session. Again, it contains the, the, the objective, again, uh, slide obje the, the, the slide with the objectives and, and uh, what I just presented here and a template for summarizing the key ideas at the end and some slide in between for the scribe to, to take note directly in PowerPoint. Kurosh, can you give us an update? Yes, I'm gonna start the rooms um, and we'll just keep assigning people. So you might get thrown into your room and then more people will be added to that room as we go. So it might be, you might be a little late to your room by a few minutes, but we will, we will continue doing this in the background. So with that, I'm going to open the rooms and we'll just continue filling people in. If you're stuck in the main room still, uh, you haven't put in your, your primary room yet, uh, just hang on for one or two minutes. Um, and if you still don't go in, then we can continue talking because I will be in the main room and uh, you can let me know where to put you. You know, you. Uh, Joel, there is, Joel, there is one question that just came up, maybe about the universal base frame before Kurush uh, shifts us all out. Sure, I, I do not see it here. I think it's in the chat. It just says, could you explain how the universal base frame works from Maha? I see, okay. So the universal base frame would be, you know, a, a plan of frame that is attached rigidly to the platen. And if you build, let's say, a building that has a width and a length larger than the shake table platen, you know, it would rest on it. And ideally, this frame has to be such that you, 
you, you would need to do a lot of analysis, I think, to, to make sure that when you, let's say, shake the building in three translation, including the vertical, that the boundary condition at the base are the same as if we had a, a rigid platen much larger, like in the E defense. You cannot start to have, you know, the, the outriggers flexing and, and vibrating and, and, and creating some non-realistic boundary condition at the base. So, so it basically to build something that would create the same effect as, as if you had a, a, a larger platen. Don't know if you'd answer your, your, your question. Uh, he said, thank you. <laughs> Great. Okay, with that, I'm gonna open up the rooms, uh, send most of the people in the rooms, and if you're left behind, uh, just wait a minute or let me know which room you'd like to go into and we'll assign you. Thank you. Okay, there's a, a few people left here. Um, if you don't mind sending me a message so I can assign you in the proper rooms, please. Okay. I've assigned uh, several. There's only three that have not been assigned currently and I'm getting messages in the chat, so. Okay, so the breakout sessions will be closing in two minutes. We just gave the two minute warning and uh, everyone's going to join back in this main room. And we'll take a short little break and we'll continue. Oh, okay, it's so, so stressful, Kirsch, that 120 <laughs> second warning. <laughs> 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 like, look at your sweating. Yeah, we need, we need one more yeah. hour, so we'll be back. Um, so, <laughs> what I can do is, uh, Can't go get a coffee in. Is, uh, since we have a break, yeah, what, what I was free to go back into the I think it would be useful to keep the rooms open until it was time to uh, start the next session so that um, <laughs> at least uh, the moderator and scribe could have. Uh, you know, finally the slide. Sure. Uh, oh, yeah, I'm going to good. reopen yeah. the rooms um, and whoever is going to be discussing the slides can go back into the rooms and the rest of you guys can just take a break, enjoy coffee. I can make some announcements. Uh, but while everybody's here, let me make one announcement just, just to make sure everybody uh, gets this. Um, we sent out an email this morning, right uh, early on at the start of the, the workshop. Uh, it's a survey that we're required to report the results to. So please uh, take a few minutes before the end of the day and uh, submit your feedback and help us out in organizing and arranging our future workshops. We'd greatly appreciate it. Um, every response you submit is anonymous. So just please be genuine. Feel free to speak your mind and let us know uh, what you think we can do better or what we're doing well enough already or whatever. Okay, I'm going to open up the room, so whoever needs to go and discuss uh, can go ahead and discuss. And the so how, how, long is, how long is the break? Uh, 15 minutes. Okay. Yep. All righty. Another announcement I can take this opportunity to make is um, if you look at the agenda, you will see that we have some office hours scheduled, one-on-one uh, -on -one sessions if you'd like. Uh, after the workshop, we, uh, the workshop is supposed to end at around 12.45. Um, you know, you can go have a lunch and, um, oh, 12.45 Pacific time. Uh, yeah, have a lunch and uh, starting at two o'clock, we will have um, Professor Tara Hutchinson and uh, Professor Vandeninda available from 2 to 3 p.m. Pacific uh, to discuss any of your questions or um, future proposals that you'd like help on. Um, and at uh, 3 o'clock, we have uh, Professor Conte. Now, um, I'm not entirely sure if, uh, if anybody plans on participating, but 
be, we are available to help and uh, have one-on-one -on -one sessions with you all during those times. The links for the Zoom meetings for those office hours are available in the agenda file. Um, so please take a look at that if you're interested. So another reminder, um, <clears throat> we're always available to answer any questions uh, you may have. If you don't have any questions right now, uh, please feel free to shoot us an email. We'll get back to you with it as soon as we possibly can. Right now, I'm going to go ahead and put my own email address uh, in the chat box so you can all have it on hand. And if you have any questions or concerns for the future, please, again, feel free to email us. I like, Karosh, I like this, uh, whatever the Zoom versions you have to have these breakout rooms and automatically go to the breakout Zoom and come back to the main room. This is a nice feature. Yeah, thank you. This is my first time uh, experiencing it and I, I like it. I think it, it works pretty well. It was a little difficult yeah. to set it up initially, but I think once you set it up, it's pretty sweet. That's pretty sweet, yeah. Thanks for the feedback. I appreciate that. I'm glad. I'm glad that you know the experience was nice on the other side too. So we are ready for uh, the, the summary of the breakout sessions. In in about one minute, the rooms are closing in sixty seconds. Oh, I see. So if, okay. if we can wait one more minute, that would be fantastic. Sure. In the meantime, if any of you has some questions, please do not hesitate. So the goal again is to have short, short summary, three minutes per group, and so that we have plenty of time to to discuss. Maybe we should reserve the question after all the summary. It's 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 better, I think. We we just have one slide. So Joel, if can uh, Kuros, can you um, allow Sergio to share his screen, not mine? I had to completely reset my computer, so. Yes, I, I will make sure. That I'm that's... basically working with bare bones right now. <clears throat> Great, Jose. So you will be the first one, right? Oh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, if you can. Okay. Yeah, mine will. Yeah, I will do that. Oh, the stress, Karush. <laughs> You guys did it to me again. I was like, we've got 30 seconds, paste it. <laughs> <laughs> Good job, Crush. So every, everybody is back from the, from the sessions, Kurosh. Who presents first? Joel. We'll go in the in the order of the number of the session, if possible. So, one concrete, two steel building, three timber, wood frame, and and so on. Okay, I'm not first. Unless one of you has to leave early and wants to present earlier, just just let us know. Will Will everybody be able to have audio? Because we were going to co-present ours. Is that uh, is everybody on audio if they need to be? Yes, everyone can unmute. Okay. Um, I, yeah, everything should right. be fine. Thank you. Yeah, same thing for when we will have the question, everybody will be unmuted, so talk whenever you want. We try to avoid having people talking at the same time. So I think, Jose, you can start. Okay, so if you, if you, uh, Kuros, if you, do me a favor and uh, enable uh, Sergio to share his uh, screen. Samuel, uh, should I think be I'm allowed. sharing screen. Yeah. Nobody sees oh, it. Oh, yeah, I see it. Uh, right. Okay, great. Okay, so um, if you go to the slide, the summary slide, Sergio, please. Oh, let's, let's first of all, let's go on. Um, in, 
show who participated in our session, and then we go to the summary. So we had um, uh, five participants in our session. So we had Juan Sebastián Zambrano from Universidad de Cuenca in Ecuador, Professor Julio Ramírez from uh, Purdue University, Maha Kenawi from uh, University of Nevada Arvino. She's a postdoctoral fellow there. Anthony Trogovich, uh, who is a former um, a student here at UC San Diego and is a lead uh, structural engineer at uh, John A. Martin and Associates at, in the Bay Area, and Govardhan Bhatt of the National Institute of Technology at Raipur. So we had, we had um, a, an excellent session with uh, most uh, participants um, giving input to uh, their research needs. And um, following the recommendation, we look at three potential topics. One is into the sheer strength of core walls in tall buildings. And uh, the second one on backstage diaphragms. And the third one on the use of high strength reinforcing steel as in lateral force resisting systems as longitudinal reinforcement. So if we go to the summary, um, thank you, Sergio. So in, uh, what happens, uh, if, to give you a little bit of background information to you all, with the advent of tall buildings in, in, um, in the west coast of the United States, in particular Seattle, Bay Area, and Los Angeles, and even here in, in San Diego, uh, we see uh, that uh, structural walls in the way of um, uh, core walls, or so just isolated walls in these buildings, are making use of uh, high strength concrete, uh, 10,000 PSI or so. And they are taking to minimize the section, they are taking these walls to the maximum uh, shear stresses that are allowed by the ACI code. Now, the provisions of the ACI code were not developed for, for these walls of this size. They, these were developed mainly for um, thin webs of I-beams or so. Um, and we have been using those here to uh, uh, basically limit the amount of shear stresses these walls can take. Now, we don't, we don't have a lot of knowledge on if this is applicable or not. We have no knowledge if we have size effects. Uh, and we don't have sufficient computational models to look into uh, this problem. So this basically offers a unique research possibility of using the shaking table uh, as a, uh, to basically do a capstone design project. And this is, this is no different from, from the projects I work in, in, in the uh, uh, this, uh, size design, diaphragm seismic design methodology and similar to what um, uh, John and his collaborators are doing with the tall uh, wood uh, building project, um, where we do a series of tests, build up the computational models to a, a significant level of understanding, and then go and do a final capstone project. So uh, since we're working here in, in, in these core walls in buildings um, with um, with very large sizes, it's impossible to test this at full scale. But certainly uh, in, in different universities, we could test a number of uh, core walls with different geometries and so on as part of a collaborative effort, um, calibrate different tools of different um, um, detailing finite elements, and then come and do um, um, a capstone here. I think from uh, by talking to uh, Julio Ramirez, Professor Ramirez, is these large research programs can be, for, for example, taken from NSF or NIST or both, and using the uh, science plans that are uh, in NERI as collaborative, collaborative programs. The second topic is on backstage diaphragms. And, and for those of you, uh, it's, it's a very uh, specific um, um, name or so. So you, you have a tall building, let's say 20, 30, 50 story building anywhere on the West Coast. And then those buildings are not, are not just a single tower. And in, in the lower floors, they spread out like a podium. And 
in, in many cases, they actually go on the ground three, four, six, or eight levels as well. So now when you have the inertia forces coming from the tower and into this podium, they disperse and they look, they look to um, a, a lot of these um, inertia forces get into the retaining walls or to the walls that the architect has placed in this building. So this looks like a very elementary pro uh, problem, but in practice, um, many structural engineers use black boxes, upper and lower bounds, but they don't even know if this is an upper or lower bound. So we know very little about this. It's, uh, a, a, again, these are uh, extremely large size elements and they lend themselves to do some um, scale testing on the, uh, on, on, on the base frame that uh, Professor Conte mentioned, so we can expand out of the platen. As a capstone project of several studies that will extensively use um, computational simulations. Again, following the, 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 the framework and the model that of the uh, Nils Tollwood uh, program or the DSDM programs in, in which I worked in the second one, I think this could be, uh, be a very successful venture as part of a co collaborative effort. These are large programs, of course. The final one is uh, topic three, is that now uh, the trend, um, a ACI has allowed, enabled now to use high strength reinforcement, reinforcing steel, which is grade 80 and grade 100, and, and, and for, for particularly grade 180 for, um, for the lateral force resisting systems in core walls and structural walls in buildings. And the aim of this is basically to reduce that significant congestion we have in, in these walls. Sometimes it gets very, very congested in buildings in either Los Angeles, San Francisco, in the Bay Area, or in Seattle. So the idea is to uh, use these uh, uh, higher uh, strength reinforcing steel to reduce congestion. But the, the thing is that we don't know much about the, the, about the uh, dynamic behavior of this reinforcing steel. They come at higher strength, but reduce ductility. So it will be uh, great to again go from the um, bar uh, in air testing to component testing and end up with a, um, a capstone project on the uh, LH pod 6 where we are able to test at some kind of a scale um, um, buildings and compare um, uh, or try to get some information about uh, great 100 reinforcing steel sometimes even even greater. I know uh, uh, Anthony Trogovic mentioned that in some cases they use grade 150, but no for longitudinal reinforcement, but they, there is a lot of interest in the community to imp, um, implementing higher grade reinforcing steel. So those are the basic uh, three topics that we uh, discuss in our group. And I would like to pass it to um, our second um, uh, subgroup that look into a, another topic. Yes, thank you very much, Jose. So, uh, Jim Mali now will uh, summarize for his group. Uh, how do I share? Uh, let's see. Where are we? <coughs> let's see. Trying to figure out how to share my video. Oh, there it is. I'm sorry, I lost it there for a second. Okay, can you see it already? Yes. Okay, great. So uh, the steel building structures topic, I'm gonna try and uh, start my stopwatch and stop it three minutes. Um, and so uh, the, the, the next is the group. Um, the participants, myself and Amon Pritt Singh from UCSD who did a great job as our scribe, Hernan Castaneda, PhD student at U UMass. Uh, Devin Huber from AISC, the director of research there. Uh, Jakob Valagura from KPFF in San Francisco, design engineer. Uh, Barb Simpson, assistant professor at Oregon State, and Paul Richards from Durfuse. And we also had a very good uh, conversation. Um, so, so we had three topics. Um, the first are 
what I'm calling BSSC rocking systems. This came out of the BSSC uh, research uh, study that Bill Holmes talked about this morning, and it was the one primary uh, steel topic in the document uh, based on some work done by ATC uh, 116. Um, what we find is that many um, standard code type short, shorter buildings, uh, brace frames especially, uh, will actually rock um, rather than uh, um, before they actually buckle uh, braces or, or yield the BRBs and if they're on, on uh, spread footing foundations. So it would be helpful to know how those systems are actually going to behave, uh, what the interaction would be with the rest of the building, etc. Um, and then you could also design some intentionally rocking systems. There are other countries that had to have uh, provisions for rocking designs that we could compare and contrast with our standard systems. We thought about doing fixed base test, um, and then and then uh, a rocking base test, just allowing it to uh, bounce on the table, and then potentially even using the soil box um, and getting soil structure interaction. So that was the first thought. Um, the second is uh, steel wood systems uh, in combination. Thought uh, maybe John Vandalint in the group would would be interested in this. Um, because it, it seems to be fairly popular to try and combine steel lateral systems with some of the CLT gravity systems. Um, and a lot of the interactions with diaphragms and how those are all going to work um, would seemingly be a very interesting test to, to have done on the, uh, on the table. Um, really could incorporate some of the resilience concepts as well into, into that topic. And then our final one is a little more open. We didn't kind of get too detailed on this one, uh, but the idea was to look at um, about look at uh, a main shock on a on a system, whether it be uh, an older system, not a complying system, and also complying system. So we could have two like two prongs in the, in the program, um, and then uh, do some damage assessment after the first test. Uh, to decide how you might want to repair it or not repair it. Maybe if you didn't think you needed to repair it, do an aftershock uh, test to see what happened there and then potentially repair it and then maybe do the, the original shock to sort of kind of t put the, uh, the, the, the specimen through its, uh, through its paces. And really there's a lot, not very much information on kind of post-earthquake res response to aftershocks as well as repaired and then retesting. So that would be the, th the third topic that we thought about. So with that, I think I'll turn it over to uh, the next presentation. Yes, thank you very much, Jim. Uh, number three would be the John van der Lint on timber wood frame building structures. All right, let me... Okay, hopefully you guys can see that we're going. We're uh, we're, we're going to do a, a group uh, presentation here, so we'll each hit one bullet. Um, and so with that, we also want to um, just acknowledge our scribe, uh, our participants. Uh, we were a smaller group, so it was myself, uh, Larry, and Steve. And with that, um, let's see. I think we said, uh, um, Larry, you'd be first, and then Steve, and then me. Right. Yeah. Thanks, John. Um, I also just wanted to say it's a real honor for me to be able to participate in this workshop. And uh, I always enjoy working with the researchers at UCSD. So um, our, our first idea for Wood uh, had to do with um, developing a, a research program to look at uh, inexpensive response modification devices that may be dampers or base isolation, um, something that would, um, you know, serve to improve performance, reduce damage. Um, and looking at that second bullet first, uh, you know, being able to utilize the vertical component or look at the vertical component with the, the changes on the table um, might be very useful based on previous um, base isolation uh, research and things. And then also we talked about um, simplifying the code provisions that exist right now that are kind of a barrier to implement 
this sort of uh, response modification into light frame wood construction. So research is always good for, for moving things forward. So um, with that, I will uh, hand it off to Steve. Uh, thanks, Larry. Thanks, John. And good, good morning or good afternoon to everybody who's here. The, the second bullet point was really derived from uh, another um, research opportunity that Bill Holmes mentioned this morning. Um, and that was as, as part of the ATC 116 project that we were involved in. We've taken a really hard look at short period structures and, you know, what affects their collapse resistance and the performance. And for light framework, it was very apparent that, you know, one of the key uh, performance indicators is just really brute strength of the structure, kind of a, a ratio of a peak capacity to building weight. And so um, more research needs to be done there to try and develop some, I, I think, simplified provisions for wood buildings that can um, take kind of a larger holistic look at their entire performance to come up with um, better performing structures that really don't have to cost much more than they do now. And to get those building up provisions uh, developed that would support that. And with that, I'll turn it over to John. All right, thanks, Steve. And, and, uh, and Jim, I'll just add, we did actually have some discussion on the, the wood-steel combination uh, um, kind of right up that alley. So uh, I think we all love the topic. We don't have it down here, but, uh, but I'm glad you did. Um, so uh, functional recovery of wood buildings. I think this is, you know, obviously this is a huge topic with the, the ongoing work uh, with, with NIST and others, but uh, and I think there's a lot of NSF projects that are that are focusing on this. And so it's really finding that balance between the structural and non-structural components uh, and, and how those can, in a way, you know, people focus and they look at, at, at a single component or a couple of components, but how do you get them all working in concert is kind of the, the thought process here. Um, and then, um, you know, really, and this is maybe more overarching, it's really that, that motivation for actually doing it, but, but that's, uh, you know, how do you, how do you take, how do you determine what the building performance should be to achieve uh, certain goals or objectives at the community level? So it's really almost like a, in a sense, it's a deep aggregation, uh, except that we can't do it that way. So we'll do it forward and we'll just iterate. Um, and so I think that's, that's uh, in, in a way uh, critical. Um, and then we, you know, just for opportunities, I'll just close by saying that, uh, you know, as, as Steve kind of indicated, we thought we'll just add one bullet here, but really um, most of the collaboration comes from the development of commodity and, and proprietary products of both. Uh, and all, these all require industry and academic collaboration uh, that, that uh, um, you know, throughout. So, so we see industry as being a key participant uh, in all these project teams that are related to wood. And with that, that is uh, our summary. So let me stop sharing and pass to group four. Thank you very much, John. Uh, group four, Georgios Tsampras on seismic retrofitting of building structures. Okay, can you see my screen? Yep. Perfect. Okay, so our group uh, consisted of uh, Leo Panian from uh, Epping Structural Engineers, myself, uh, Professor Benson Singh from UC San Diego, Alex Lee from Southern California Edison, uh, Bill Horstman from Pacific Gas Electric Company, San Francisco, uh, Sina Yusefiano, yeah. Dam from University at Buffalo, I'm sorry, Sina, uh, Ahmad Ali, uh, and Kushai Akuli, Saif Hussein, uh, Guid, Professor Guido Kamata, and uh, Lishan from UC San Diego, uh, who took also the notes. So thank you, uh, Lynn. Um, so our, our team uh, worked on the seismic uh, retrofit uh, schemes. And um, the first topic that we focused was um, the retrofit of mid-rise uh, welded steel moment resisting frame structures. Um, well, the issue identified there was uh, that we have the weak story mechanism 
and uh, more specifically, the weak story mechanism drives the demand to uh, column splices that have uh, uh, a potential fracture uh, issue of the partial uh, penetration weld. Um, also, the shear connections uh, of the gravity beams uh, faced, uh, are problematic uh, because of this weak story mechanism, and we may <clears throat> uh, lose our capacity to carry the gravity load. Um, so we identified that there is a need to um, basically use uh, this opportunity to utilize the shake table uh, in order to assess uh, the dynamic effects in these steel moment resistant frames and um, basically try to uh, evaluate retrofit schemes that may utilize uh, different configurations of uh, seismic uh, response modification devices such as buckling strain braces um, to control the distribution of the load throughout uh, uh, these uh, vulnerable frames. Uh, the second topic uh, uh, was related to the out-of-plane behavior of uh, unreinforced uh, masonry structures. Now, um, it, it is, uh, I guess, from a research perspective, it is a great opportunity to utilize the uh, multi-directional uh, ground motion uh, capability that we will have with the LH post 6 in order to uh, combine this uh, uh, lateral uh, ground motion with the vertical uh, ground motions uh, in order to evaluate the seismic capacity of uh, the uh, unreinforced masonry, specifically the effect to the out of plane behavior. Um, we discussed about the need to un better understand uh, retrofit schemes that utilize FRP in order to provide this additional out of strength, uh, out of plane strength. And um, also we touched upon uh, to the importance of understanding the effect of infill uh, walls in the global response of building structures. Um, and this is mainly because of uh, the non-ductile response and um, how can we address that? What is the detailing that we need to uh, use in order to um, make sure that we don't have negative effects of this infill uh, walls. Uh, the last topic uh, was related to um, the seismic gap between buildings that have uh, different uh, dynamic characteristics. Um, so sometimes uh, there is an issue with uh, one owner um, uh, basically has few buildings that are adjacent but they have different dynamic characteristics and there are limitations in the seismic gap. Instead of uh, trying uh, to increase the seismic gap, which is impossible, uh, you can tie the buildings together using seismic response modification devices in order to control the forces that are flowing from one system to the other. So one idea was that we could utilize the modular frames that we discussed in order to create, uh, let's say, two buildings with dynamic, uh, different dynamic characteristics. Uh, couple them together um, in order to see the effect on the dynamic response of these modular frames, but also assess the effect on the um, non-structural components that, that may span between these two uh, buildings. Um, and again, this comes back to uh, the idea of uh, utilizing something that the shake table can provide and have uh, repetitive uh, types of uh, tests. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much, Georgios. And now number session number five, Anthony Sanchez on bridge structures. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep. All right, good. Let me pull up our uh, PowerPoint.
Okay, good. All right, can you see that? Yep, yep. All right, good. All right, so our participants were myself, Anthony Sanchez, uh, Jian Yu Cheng, uh, who's a PhD student at UC San Diego, Charlie Sikorsky, uh, who's retired from Caltrans. He used to be the research, uh, one of the research managers uh, working with UC San Diego on research topics. Now he's with ITS at UC Berkeley. And Petros Sedaris, assistant professor at Texas A&M, uh, who has been doing research on low damage bridge systems. So our three topics are uh, damage resistant bridge systems, foundation rocking, and different topics related to durability. So topic one, uh, damage resistant design. Um, we were taking this to mean uh, unbonded post tensioning in columns uh, to reduce uh, damage in plastic hinges and uh, self-center the bridge after an earthquake and also sliding in rocking joints. And uh, this research has been done. Uh, some research has been done already at UC San Diego, uh, UNR, Texas A&M, University of Washington, and Buffalo. So there's been tests, but there's no clear path on how to implement this into practice. Uh, Charlie pointed out that it, it would be difficult to content, uh, convince Caltrans and the other DOTs uh, that uh, it could be beneficial and uh, the, the benefit has not been quantified yet. Um, it's difficult to uh, do field demonstration projects. Uh, if you did a demonstration project, uh, you'd have to wait. You know, it could be decades for uh, an earthquake to happen to test it. So we do need full scale or large large scale testing. Um, but this funding may be difficult to obtain. Uh, it tends to be uh, pretty expensive, uh, uh, maybe one million to two million dollars per test. Um, also, the DOTs and the state bridge engineers are comfortable with the current design methods. Uh, they work well. They've been uh, tested. They're in the codes. Uh, they've been proof tested during earthquakes. So everyone's comfortable with the current uh, seismic design criteria and the ductility methods. So uh, we think it'll take time to convince the DOTs uh, that we should start doing this testing. Um, I think if we quantified how much money can be saved, uh, that seems like that would be a, a relatively inexpensive uh, desktop study to show based on past earthquakes what uh, the level of damage was to bridges and if some of these bridges had uh, these uh, um, damage resistant systems in place, uh, how much could money could we have saved in, in current dollars? And then also uh, quantify other impacts such as uh, reduced impacts to traffic. For example, if a bridge uh, does not collapse but needs to be uh, torn down and replaced, that's gonna have a big impact to traffic. So uh, what is that in terms of uh, uh, impact to the economy? Uh, there should be a way to quantify that as well. Um, so I think if we can show uh, the benefits uh, through maybe a, um, a low cost study, rather than doing the shake, uh, trying to do the shake table testing right away, that could lead to more funding for the shake table tests. All right, so that's topic number one. Uh, topic number two is uh, foundation rocking. So this is where either you have a spread footing that is allowed to uh, uplift and rock, or uh, if you need a pile footing, uh, like we have shown here schematically, you build the pile footing that you need, but then you put a reduced size spread footing on top and that spread footing now can rock on top of the pile cap. <clears throat> so the, the idea here is that this rocking would occur before the plastic hinge forms. So you can reduce uh, damage to the columns. Um, you would never get a plastic hinge. So the, the system would stay elastic and the energy is dissipated and the displacement capacity comes from rocking of the foundation. So this seems like a, a great approach if, if uh, 
<clears throat> if this can be implemented, it seems like it's a low cost. It can actually reduce the cost. For example, uh, if you if you're have a good design methodology to allow spread footings to rock, you can make these spread footings smaller than you otherwise would uh, if you don't allow uplift. So you, you can reduce the initial capital cost for new bridges and then also reduce uh, damage and uh, future costs of replacing damaged bridges. So it seems like it's a win-win there. Uh, the problem is uh, the current mindset of the industry is to avoid foundation rocking. A lot of the bridge engineers uh, are uh, used to uh, not allowing uplift in footings. Uh, they want to make the footings bigger, to put tie downs, you know, kind of a, a brute force approach to resisting the seismic loads, but uh, it's actually, I believe, going in the wrong direction. We want the bridge, our bridges to be more flexible, not, not more stiff. Um, so we need to change that mindset in the industry. Um, and I think we need the research to back it up to, sh to show that it is a reliable mechanism for uh, dissipating seismic uh, forces and that it, it's uh, ways to assess the stability so that we can be uh, certain that the system is going to be stable uh, and then come up with some easy to implement design methodologies. So I think there's a big uh, um, opportunity to do some research there to, to show how we would design these rocking systems. And then also a big topic of bridge, uh, the bridge industry right now is, is accelerated bridge construction. So it seems like this would be very well suited to ABC where you have these precast components. And if you can just take a precast footing and set it down uh, on top of a pile cap uh, without any uh, monolithic connection, that, that, that's ideal. So I think we can work with, uh, maybe there's funding available for accelerated bridge construction that we can combine uh, to show this, these rocking systems. All right, so that was topic number two. And then topic number three had to do with different ways to uh, increase durability in bridges. Uh, some of these may have uh, applications for the um, the high performance outdoor shake table. Uh, some may not uh, uh, have uh, applications. Uh, for example, uh, ultra high performance concrete for bridge decks. So uh, the DOTs are spending a lot of money now uh, rehabbing and replacing bridge decks. They, they get the most wear of any part of the bridge. Uh, that's where the, the live loads are, are hitting. Uh, the, the deck, they're getting impacts and uh, they get beat up over the years. So if we can come up with more durable bridge decks, uh, that could save a lot of money, uh, reduce maintenance costs. Um, uh, we, were, we were talking about doing long-term degradation testings uh, for, could be for the rocking foundations or for the, um, the, uh, um, uh, damage resistant systems. So where we, we would test them, uh, build them, uh, test them initially, and then just let them sit uh, and, and potentially uh, do some aging, some uh, accelerated aging, uh, whether we're spraying them with salt water or, or putting some kind of live load uh, on them to see how they degrade and then testing them later. So that would give us a more realistic um, uh, way to test these bridges in service, right? Because if we build uh, one of these bridge systems, uh, the earthquake's not going to happen immediately. It may happen in 20 years or 50 or 70 years. So we'd like to know that these systems are durable and that uh, see what they respond like, how they can uh, withstand earthquakes uh, once they've deteriorated or been in service for a long time. And uh, then we're talking about doing live load testing on the shake table. So I know all the discussions ha have been about doing seismic testing, uh, but maybe there's a way to use the outdoor shake table to simulate live loading uh, and uh, to simulate uh, uh, many, uh, many, many cycles of live loading. Uh, that could be good for testing the durability of bridge decks or also testing fatigue in steel members. So that was our, our topic number three. Uh, there's a picture of the 
is a, a deck that I showed uh, yesterday. Uh, it's a bridge in Stockton that uh, Caltrans is spending millions of dollars fixing this deck uh, every few years. And then uh, potential funding sources. We all decided that NSF uh, is not a good source of funding when it comes to bridges. They defer to FHWA uh, for bridges. Uh, so you have FHWA, and then you also have all the, the state DOTs, especially uh, the ones in seismic uh, regions. So of course, Caltrans, WashDOT, also Alaska DOT, Oregon DOT, Hawaii DOT, and also Idaho and Utah. So there's our summary of the three topics. Thank you very much, Tony. All right, you're welcome. And now let's go to uh, Amarnath Kasalamati on earthquake protective systems. Thank you, John. I, as soon as uh, Sanchez releases, okay, I will share the screen. And, uh, Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's still morning. Um, uh, can you see my screen all right, John? Yes, yes. Okay, great. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be in this uh, uh, session. And uh, uh, we had a very good group. We had, um, you know, good representation from uh, academia, uh, manufacturer, uh, a practitioner, and uh, also, uh, many people who have used protective systems uh, internationally uh, were there. That is just captured in uh, eight people you see here. I want to thank uh, Claudio Sepulveda for being the scribe and taking uh, excellent notes. Um, like all other groups, um, we were very excited uh, about the large uh, size of the table as well as the opportunity to apply multidirectional excitation. Um, you know, uh, that is uh, the same for all researchers, but specifically for isolation and energy dissipation fields, as well as uh, rocking columns and such, uh, the ability of this table uh, to reproduce the motion in low frequency or long period content, uh, that is of great importance. Uh, some of the smaller tables cannot do that, so we cannot push the isolated structures quite as uh, uh, much as what uh, they see in the field. So uh, this table provides that opportunity. And also we are excited about the rotational motion and what it means. Uh, but uh, of the different things we discussed, uh, we identified three topics. And um, one is uh, the ultimate behavior of uh, devices uh, as well as structures uh, with the protective devices. And Professor Mosqueda uh, contributed to this. Um, and uh, basically, uh, as the, the design level motions, uh, that behavior is well understood. Uh, but uh, what happens at MCE and with the superstructure yielding, uh, how do these devices interact? And uh, uh, again, this facility with its size and uh, performance capabilities will provide opportunities uh, to test bearings uh, to limits and, uh, and, and study what happens to the overall uh, structure and, and design. Uh, the second one is about um, improving code equations. You know, uh, when you have uh, systems with intersecting lateral uh, uh, systems, uh, you use a 100 plus 30 percent type of equations, which uh, may be unconservative, but a 100 plus 100 would be too conservative. So what is the right uh, combination? Uh, those kind of things. Uh, here, it can be combined with what was discussed by the previous breakout uh, groups. Uh, uh, doesn't have to be an isolated or damped, uh, but you can have the damped ones uh, are isolated ones later. For example, you know, in the code, uh, very often you use um, a combination of uh, hysteretic damping in the superstructure combined with the supplemental damping in the devices. But large structures have not been pushed to the 
yielding and limits to validate uh, some of those uh, equations. Uh, again, this LH post six will provide uh, opportunities to do that. And then the third one uh, we discussed is, um, uh, is the vertical motion and its impact on uh, uh, response. Um, uh, many of you know of uh, the testing done at eDefense uh, led by Professor Kerry Ryan. Uh, it answered many questions, but it also raised several questions about the vertical motion and uh, performance of uh, non-structural components. And um, it really, it is one data point. Uh, there are several papers, uh, but uh, we can add more data by replicating some of those on LH post 6 and understanding the vertical motions and uh, its impact. Um, so those are broadly what we discussed, uh, condensed uh, into three topics. Uh, as for the funding sources, uh, the usual suspects are there, uh, NHS, FEMA, and, and so on. But um, uh, California resiliency is uh, talked about a bit. Uh, perhaps we are not taking advantage of it as much as we could, or uh, we should be more involved. Uh, that is one uh, that is identified. Um, again, another <laughs> usual suspect is uh, any high-tech company that uh, uh, have a lot of data centers, you know, uh, talking to them about uh, isolating or damping their structures. Um, but uh, more importantly, um, a representative from Taylor Devices was in the discussion and uh, has kindly offered to provide dampers. Again, um, it, depending on a lot of things working out, size and uh, type of experiments, uh, but uh, that was one <laughs> thing. And uh, also reaching isolation system manufacturers. Uh, the previous large scale tests, uh, there were very large combined efforts with manufacturers contributing, uh, they will play a key role in uh, making some of these uh, tests happen. Um, electrical systems could benefit from this research. So uh, that is another source uh, we identified. And then taking advantage of that uh, test bed uh, that Joel mentioned yesterday about uh, reconfigurable, uh, perhaps go to yield and replace some things and how, how do we take advantage of that. So that that's another one. Um, basically, uh, the concluding thought is, you know, the SRMD test machine in San Diego uh, that's been in use for about 20 years, uh, its work, it had made from research into practice and into code uh, with lambda factors or bounded design and so on for isolation and damping. Um, the hope of this group is LH post six uh, will do the same uh, for system level performance of uh, uh, structures using protective uh, devices. And again, I thank uh, all the participants in this group. Joel, back to you. Thank you very much, Anamad. And now let's go to number seven with uh, Jorge Meneses on geostructures. Okay, um, I'm going to select, I'm going to share my screen. All right, so this is a breakout session on uh, geohazards. Uh, my name is Jorge Meneses and I serve as the, the moderator. Uh, Maitreya Kurumbati from UCSD served as the scribe. <clears throat> uh, we, this is the list of the participants. <clears throat> uh, myself, Maitreya the scribe, uh, Bill Black with Mid and Hunt, uh, Ramin Motamed with the University of Nevada, Reno, Teresa uh, Richards, UCSD, and Zia Safir uh, Kleinfelder. Initially, what we did is uh, we did a kind of brainstorm just to identify some potential research areas of, or topics. So first of all, I would like to emphasize that in the field of geotechnical earthquake engineering is very, very important large scale testing. Uh, in the past, traditionally has been in the physical, within physical modeling, uh, small scale testing has been performed. 
uh, 1G small scale testing and also uh, centrifuge testing. However, um, there are some, of course, advantages, but also there are some disadvantages doing this small uh, scale testing. Um, we can capture important information doing this type of um, uh, testing, but also at the same time, when we perform large scale testing, as we can do here using the LH post 6 facilities, is that we can uh, um, have a better picture of the issues that we want to identify. We are going to discuss something about this later uh, when we identify some issues, but uh, I think that this is the, the very important thing um, uh, at least in geotechnical earthquake engineering, the large scale testing uh, component. Uh, possible uh, research areas, uh, study uh, the behavior of piles, uh, foundations in general, uh, uh, pipes in saturated sand under earthquake forces, uh, behavior of shallow foundations in liquefiable soils, uh, large scale testing can complement uh, existing available centrifuge testing in this area, uh, performance uh, design of retaining structures. Yesterday, C.C. Nicolau did a very, very important uh, presentation about this uh, topic. And I think this is something that has to be pursued because there are still many things that we need to investigate and evaluate for appropriate uh, characterization of the distribution of the seismic lateral earth forces on retaining structures. Also, another topic that we uh, covered, discussed is input motions, how the input motions are used uh, using this facility, uh, the importance, for example, of near source, versus a far source, the importance of short duration versus long duration, subduction versus shallow crustal, etc. Fault rupture, of course, is something very important that Craig described uh, yesterday. Um, and also another topic is, for example, things like interaction of concrete dams with reservoir water. Each one has a different frequency of vibration and this interaction could be something interesting also to, to evaluate. So we selected three topics uh, based on this discussion. Uh, number one is in general behavioral foundations, uh, shallow and deep um, pipes in, in saturated sand under earthquake forces. Uh, basically we're interested when, for example, during the shaking, during the ground motion, uh, soil liquefies, right? We are interested in eff effects of liquefaction and the induced lateral spread on foundations and also pipes. If we are talking about this type of uh, elements, of course, we are talking basically about, for example, port facilities, harbor facilities. Um, and also we are concerned that in the future, probably in the next 50 years, we have to address, and we have to address from now, uh, experimentally also, the effects of climate change. Like for example, the sea level rise will contribute to uh, the increase of coastal areas subjected to liquefaction and lateral spread. And this effect has been to, uh, needs to be studied um, using this large scale uh, testing. So this is something that uh, <clears throat> this facility will contribute a lot uh, evaluating these effects. Another thing that was discussed yesterday presented by CC and we would like to see this pursuit is a study evaluation of performance and design of retaining structure. Um, in the field, in, I mean, in the literature, if we see there will be some information about small scale testing, uh, physical testing, uh, centrifuge testing, but there is no much information about uh, retaining structures. So this is something that we believe will contribute a lot more to understand better the behavior of these structures, uh, uh, depending upon the type of the backfield, depending upon the type of the wall, restrained versus unrestrained. Uh, all these variables need to be investigated. And we believe that there is not enough experimental studies. And we think that um, uh, large scale uh, will complement current studies uh, using uh, the centrifuge. This is something that is needed urgent, uh, especially in the practice. <clears throat> Another topic is about input motions. So especially, you know, when we are dealing with um, 
uh, nonlinear time history analysis of structures and their performance uh, based design is, is needed to develop time histories. Um, there is still some uh, many aspects to cover, if not only from the point of view of engineering seismologies, the study of the ground motion per se, but also at the same time, it's, it's important to see how um, certain characteristics of ground motions affect the response of structures uh, affect the response of the model models that are tested uh, 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 under this facility. So what are the criteria to use input motions? How they are developed? How they are selected? Are they considering near source effects? Uh, for example, in near source effect, there are certain characteristics, for example, the poles, how the poles will affect the presence or not of these poles will affect the response of, the, of a model sitting on, on these facilities. So this is something that I think needs more discussion and also needs to be investigated, how this, um, um, uh, this aspect of um, uh, testing uh, is addressed depending upon, of course, the, um, uh, the testing the, that is being, uh, being done. <clears throat> so also we discussed some potential funding sources, uh, of course, NSF, Caltrans, Spear, the farming of uh, neighboring states. There are some that are willing to uh, support this type of uh, studies, testing. Uh, probably industry industry partnership with LA DWP or some energy comp companies. Uh, ports, we believe that could be very interested also in this topic, especially with the sea level, level rise, uh, port of, of, of LA, port of Long Beach, uh, California Earthquake Authority, and probably other uh, federal level agencies such as the NRC, the Department of Energy, um, I think this is basically the summary of the three topics that we are uh, uh, somehow uh, that we discuss and we are suggesting for future uh, for consideration under uh, geostructures. Thank you, Joel. Thank you very much, Jorge. And the next one, number eight, Lifeline Utilities by Craig Davis and Elide Pantolier. I don't know who will present, I think Craig, yes. Yes, I, I will present. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, uh, yeah, so the breakout topic is lifelines. I am the moderator and I Ildi Pantolini, uh, I'm Holy, sorry, <laughs> I mispronounced Where? that. From UC San Diego. Um, uh, we could skip these slides as it's there uh, from the description. Uh, our participants were, excuse me for not necessarily getting all your names correctly, but Boris Jeremic from UC Davis, Yua Ming Wang from UC San Diego, Soji Wu uh, from EMD International, Christian Fausto, uh, uh, Master student and works for Southern California Edison. Sissy Nicolau from WSP. Gloria Ferroni from UCSD. Some of these had to come and go at different times during uh, the session, and we had, uh, I think, a good mix of discussion between research and industry. Um, I want to give a quick background slide on the focus of what we're going to present as our topics. So we had targets based on topics that uh, we proposed are based on unique capabilities of the LA Post 6 that it provides. I don't think that's a well-written statement that I made, but I hope you get the understanding. And to improve the existing design philosophy, for example, recovery-based design rather than uh, damage-resistant design. So we're talking about systems here, the lifeline and the ability to provide services, that, that type of a concept that requires much more depth discussion and research on its own. Um, and I'm, we're gonna, I'm gonna present some high level topics that we concluded on, um, which may be different than earlier discussions. You know, we're not talking about high strength rebar, we're talking about systems. Um, so the ideas of, of these details that you've heard in many of the earlier presentations need to still be fleshed out as you project goes forward. So these high level topics really could be long 
long-term programs in them into themselves. And each testing scheme, re scheme requires more detailed descriptions on the material, structural and geotechnical issues, uh, and so on, targeting specific types of knowledge to be gained by the different tests. So uh, we're going to actually present four topics in two slides. So I think my three minutes start now. Uh, the topic one is systems testing of lifelines. So this was summarized in my presentation yesterday. So we're going to investigate the interaction, the interconnection of components within stations. For example, electric power substations are commonly used, but there's treatment systems, uh, treatment plants, and water and wastewater. There's there's the refineries and, and many other types of components related to uh, all these different lifeline systems that we're talking about. So it's a general topic. We're trying to give a vision of what it is. They all interconnect, right? So this this big table gives us an opportunity to uh, either do full scale or potentially scale models uh, of all these different components and how they interconnect. And instead of looking at each one separately, you know, they, they interact. So we're able to look at that. And then from that, we can start looking deeper into the fragilities of each of these components and uh, the different types of designs that you might have. Just, just for each of these components, there's many ways of, of designing them, right? So. So to take AG 258, I think that's the right number on fragilities of buildings. And they began to focus on different types of structural types, uh, different structural types. And, and so you can think about that for transformers. There's different types of transformers and the bushing, and then how they're connecting to other types of structures. There's different ways of running the lines. There's different types of these alternate structures and how they all interact. And then there's layouts within these facilities, right? So you have you have a wide, you actually have an infinite number of possibilities, but you could actually start narrowing these down to very common types of layouts and very common types of materials and designs within each of these components and how they all interact. So then topic two, tall structures with six degrees of freedom apply, uh, being tested. The lifelines have many unique tall structures. Some examples are the wind turbines, pallet towers, smokestacks. The list goes on and on and on. Um, so think of these tall structures. Now, small rotations at the base uh, make a big difference. We saw that in a presentation yesterday. I forgot exactly who it was, but uh, I think the reference to uh, one of my PhD advisors, Professor Sukunik from USC, in one of his research studies showing how that makes a difference. So not, but not only that, but the multi-directional shaking makes a big difference. I made reference to recording in the LA 80 foot high uh, 100 foot high, I think it was uh, LA Reservoir Outlet Tower that swung, I think, 10 times and 1G recorded in both directions. So that means it's swinging in a circle. Right? That, that's a very big difference in, in stresses in the members than when you're shaking at 2D. So you might think about going back first and foremost to this wind turbine, testing that same wind turbine again with these multiple degrees of freedom to start to begin to understand how these. Uh, multiple degrees of freedom actually do make a difference. Start documenting that and then create a program where you're systematically testing these different outlet towers with different materials and retrofit schemes and, and so on. Um, topic three is long linear above ground structures. Yesterday I gave a presentation on um, on pipelines, uh, but there, there's also uh, transmission cables and when they're shaking them in different, they swing and they can hit each other and create faults. And, and so there's, there's all kinds of different long linear types of structures. Uh, here we're talking about above ground, I get to below ground in the next one. So we need to investigate the differential behavior of the foundation from wave propagation and different soil conditions at each site uh, and how the, 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 the supporting uh, effect, the, the, uh, the, the supported components behave the wires, the pipelines, the concrete slabs, and so on, uh, with out of phase motion between these different supports. Um, and from this, and actually it applies to some of the earlier parts, uh, uh, I think topic one, we should think about extending the size of the, ta the table. So we're not necessarily talking about large um, or massive structures, but maybe we could use the capacity of the table to allow for cantilevering out to test more in this area for topic one, right? When we're looking at systems and, and for the lengths of these, these uh, uh, long linear structures. Uh, 
Um, so we challenge people, researchers, to think about that. And then topic four is below ground structures or underground structures. Uh, there's many unique and complicated structures, uh, box type structures and pipe type structures or cable type. I, I, I talked about it as type. Um, and so I referred to presentations yesterday, but I itemized some topics here. For sake of time, I talked about these in my presentation yesterday, so there's more detail in there. But these are the four types of structures or four types of programs, actually, that we recommend this to be taken on. So, so well, these could be very long, decades long programs that, that get integrated into the testing. Uh, potential funding sources would be maybe combined NIST, uh, NSF, and industry. The industry may provide less funding, but more value in, in, in kind, resources, material, engineering, and input from a, a tactical industry perspective. Then there's other federal agencies, EPA, DOE, uh, um, and so on. So think about, uh, you know, communications. Uh, uh, they, they have many different types of uh, federal agencies governing them, and so and state agencies. So uh, these are types of things that could be addressed uh, for funding. And I'm going to leave it there for um, uh, the next. Yep. Thank you very much, Craig. Thank you very much. Oh, sure. uh, okay. Number nine, uh, Professor Tara Hutchinson talk about non-structural components and systems. Okay, great. I'll just get the screen shared. Can you see the slides okay? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, myself and uh, Michael Morano, one of our PhD students, helped uh, moderate and scribe this session. Um, we had a, a very good discussion um, for our participants. Uh, Robert Belvin from Construction Specialties, coming with an interesting angle of um, the architectural perspective. Nate Deibler from BMC Group, uh, doing a lot of work on testing and certification of, of NCSs. Scott Harvey as an academic researcher, looking at equipment isolation and seismic protection, amongst other things. Uh, Hussein Mustafai from FM Global, doing a lot of work on earthquake losses and risk brings a very unique perspective to the issue of the overarching issue of NCSs and Derek Watkins, one of our former PhD students, has a rich career in looking at issues of qualification of equipment, piping bracing, and the like. So we had seven of us in this discussion. We discussed six topics and um, in the interest of time, we were requested, of course, to bubble up the top three. Um, and the way we organized these was, uh, you know, what the, what the general topic was, um, what some of the issues we each could bring to the table relative to that topic, um, what some possible solutions might be with LH Post 6 to addressing and contributing to advancing this topic. And, and there's, you know, there's definitely some impediments. In the interest of time, I'll just, um, just, just you know, point out the topic and then, and then uh, offer up what our thoughts were on what the possible solutions were with uh, the exciting advancements of LH, LH Post 6. So the first topic was um, seismic force estimates for NCSs. Uh, in a global sense, <laughs> our consensus was the, the, the general expression of FSP just doesn't work well across the board. It, perhaps it works for some, not for others, and there's a variety of issues I think one could bring to, to bear to recognize that. However, um, with LH Post, um, and possibly the use of a universal base frame, for example, or the modular test building um, that could facilitate experiments to study the FCP distribution. Uh, that was one option. Another option might be, and of course, there could be a long laundry list of, of uh, you know, structural configurations to study this issue. But uh, fixing connections to the reaction mass and moving with with moving and and or flexible connections to LH post. Uh, or the universal best fr base frame that could also f provide provide seismic provide an opportunity to report seismic forces for semi flexible con connections. The second topic, I'm not sure that you are if there's an impediment in your screen uh, for the top of the slide. Sorry about that. Um, second topic was interactions between NCSs and interactions with between the NCSs and the primary structure. So there's separate topics, but similar um, 
problematic um, and uncertain response issues that come to bear. Um, we know that they're not always isolated components. We, we ask the question, are they synergistic or are they counterproductive? Um, I think Professor Scott Harvey had some really interesting points there. Could they be aggrav aggravated? And if not, could we utilize flexible connections? Um, and if so, could we use, utilize flexible connections? So some possible solutions to study with LH post six. Um, uh, one, I think healthy discussion was the idea of performing hybrid testing with the shake table, with the newly configured shake table, newly upgraded table. The computer model in that case would be the building that would allow the researcher to easily modify the computer model to account for different buildings and configurations. Whereas the NCS as a specimen would be the physical payload um, and, and that would allow multiple, in fact, NCSs to be uh, mounted and assembled and or arrayed onto LH plus six. The other natural, uh, natural thing, and I think the modular test bed has been sort of strategically designed to help out with you know, collecting information in this regard um, was to, to, to strategically lay out a program in a systematic fashion and, and use uh, that three-story building to deliver those interactions. The third topic was the response of contents. Um, a lot, the data that's out there has largely been limited, largely been limited to residential contents, shelving, small, small, really small contents. And Hossein really uh, brought this up as an impediment in their work from the insurer's point of view. Um, the reality as we, is um, the data is lacking uh, for large warehouse uh, type of contents, especially those that are mounted, they're elevated. Um, pharmaceutical, mechanical equipment, uh, manufacturing storage facilities, wine storage facilities were some of the ones uh, brought up. Um, the, the limitation there is that damage vulnerability functions are really not well developed because the experimental data as a basis to understand the damage is, is lacking. So, so possible solutions with LH posts and natural a natural opportunity to test at full-scale storage racks under uh, multiple degrees of freedom input excitation. Uh, and then the, the parallel to that or the follow-on might be to, to investigate protective systems that could be utilized um, in, this, uh, in this scenario to, uh, to, to, to protect these large and heavy contents often mounted on um, either single point or multiple point storage racks. So I tried to give us a little time back. Hope that was uh, useful. I want to thank the colleagues who joined that session. Thank you very much, Tara. And the last one, seismic qualification of equipment, Derek Watkins. Hello. Let me share my screen. Derek was multitasking, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We claimed him in our session. <laughs> Moderated See? one session, finished early, and we jumped into, or I jumped into this the other one. All right, so our topic was seismic certification of equipment. Um, the participants are listed here. We had a small group, but a nice um, diversity from university to test lab to um, utilities to uh, people who do seismic certification as consultants. Our priority research needs, topic one is commercial testing needs. We believe because the size and payload capacity of the LH post that um, a significant amount of commercial testing could be done there, uh, potentially up to two, three months a year of testing for very large equipment that's currently being tested either at Berkeley or at uh, the Army Corps of Engineers lab. To do that, the lab will need to have the certain accreditations and quality assurance status uh, that it needs. It may already have some, may need to expand it. And then topic three was research needs. I guess on the industry commercial testing side, there's a variety of test standards that the lab would have to be uh, certified to, IEEE 693, 344, and AC 156. Uh, we would need to know for different payloads, especially heavy equipment, what the spectral 
capabilities of the table are on the low frequency end and on the high frequency end. Um, some equipment, the standard for AC-156 is to test up to 3.2 Gs, 5% damp spectral acceleration. Uh, but for uh, specific projects in 693 and nuclear, it could be higher as much as uh, 5 or 6 Gs. And then some narrow banded frequencies, even up to 10, 12 Gs. Uh, the equipment, heavy equipment, is not going to be a problem for the table since it's designed to take so much payload. Uh, the most important thing I would be uh, that cost and schedule at this lab are similar to or competitive with other commercial labs that can test heavy equipment. Uh, the, the table would have to be outfitted with uh, a sort of special platen on top of the platen that's sacrificial that you could bolt and weld to. And then instrumentation requirements. Uh, some tests require actual direct displacement measurement at the top of the equipment and then load and strain in the anchorage of the equipment. The accreditation that you would need on the commercial side is uh, IAS accreditation or ISO 17025, which I believe the lab already has. Uh, just needs to list AC-156 and IEEE 693 on the certificate. And then if uh, the lab is interested in doing nuclear testing, it would have to be an NQA-1 ASME quality assurance program. So I think that's a majority of what I can see the table being used for. And, you know, funding for that is by the individual manufacturers who are looking to achieve a seismic certification. On the research side, we think that because of the size of the platen um, and the payload capacity, there's some heavy transformers that have bushing failures and substation equipment that uh, could be investigated on the table. And then another thing for substation components as well as other interconnected components is this need to put maybe two or three pieces of equipment on the table interconnected especially substation equipment and see how the, the interconnection causing load back into the equipment uh, works. And then we don't know the current status of suspended ceiling testing, um, but if the table had a wall mounted frame as well as like a elevated ceiling mounted test frame, then you could do suspended ceiling testing. So that was it. Great, thank you very much, mm -hmm. Eric. So obviously you had a very fruitful discussion in, in, the, in the sessions, it appears, from the, this high concentration of great ideas that we just heard of. So it's, it's excellent input for us. Now, in terms of time, we, we are close to the end. So maybe what I suggest is we, we, we take a few big questions that some of you may have. I mean, one that I would like to ask and hear your comments about is, you've seen the test on, on the facility here. They are very expensive, very large scale. And you also saw from, from some presentation and some from blind studies that were taken in the past, the modeling uncertainty in, you know, related to the current prediction in our field are, are, are very large if not huge. And do you have any uh, suggestion on mechanism to, to get more mileage out of this very expensive test, you know, to connect the researchers who focus, you know, on numerical simulation, modeling, prediction, and so that we can maybe tackle this problem of modeling uncertainty and, and, and try to manage it and, and reduce it. That's, that's one question that I would have, but please, if you have other questions, let's have some discussion. Joel, this is John. Um, I have yeah. a comment slash question, but 
Um, I know uh, ever you know NSF originally when NIS was was going. Of course, we all remember they had the Grand Challenge projects, which enabled people to to have significant budget to be able to to run fairly large tests, and then that uh, you know went away essentially, and it became these collaborative projects where everybody's getting maybe a few hundred thousand dollars, but it has to be pulled together. Um, and I and I know a lot of people have argued. Uh, you know, unsuccessfully or suggested, I guess, maybe maybe not argued, but suggested to NSF that this was a, a good mechanism and things. And um, so, you know, one one thought for uh, for getting the most mileage out of these, you know, I wonder if there's a way, you know, much like DOTs do these pool pool funded studies, and they they fund they you know pool their funds together. Uh, and I wonder if there's, I wonder if there's a mechanism to do something like that, um, because it, it happens, you know, it does happen, uh, um, informally. Um, but then I think there's the issues, the, the issues of, you know, who's, who's running it, who's getting credit for things. And so I think if there was, you know, it might be something like there could be a workshop on how to, how to, how to pull fund these, these big projects, uh, where everybody, you know, where the, the IP is worked out, things like that. But anyway, just to throw that out there, because I think the Grand Challenge projects, I think they served a great purpose. I'd love to see them come back, but, uh, but I, don't, I'm, I don't work for NSF, so. <laughs> yeah, sure. I think the key here is, is the funding available to those who would focus part of their time and research on, on correlating and not just have all the money, you know, to, to do the experiment and, and, and build the specimen. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and maybe the last comment I'll make uh, related to that is if there's a way to, uh, you know, to move the structure off the table uh, and then back on, you know, for, uh, for reuse, um, you know, so it can be repaired maybe out in the field for a longer period of time. That that would be huge because uh, you know uh, you know getting a hundred thousand dollars to repair a building is not hard if it becomes your specimen, but getting two million to build one is so. Yeah, thank you, John, for your comment. Any any other question related to what we just heard or or to the workshop or overall? No, maybe I have another question for, if Anthony is still here, Tony Sanchez, you, you, you recommended lo low cost study uh, for damage resistant design. Maybe can you be elaborate a little more? You, you mean numerical simulation studies first uh, or? No, I was talking about an economic study to figure oh. out uh, what the extent of the damage was during recent earthquakes and then to, to quantify how much we can save if we went to this uh, damage resistant systems rather than the, the ductility based systems we're using now. Okay. That, that'd be in terms of uh, replacement costs, damage repair, plus uh, impacts to traffic. That has, uh, you can put a dollar amount on the impacts to traffic as well. Yeah, thank you for clarifying. You're welcome. Any comments related to this topic of uh, you know a large universal base frame so that we can expand the, the the footprint of the specimen that we want to test? Some of them mentioned that in in their summary uh, briefly, but anybody wants to add some comments about that, the need for that, or, or what? what we should consider in thinking about that. Uh, this is Derek. I would just say from the equipment testing side, the 40 foot by 25 foot footprint is probably pretty good for most of the equipment we'd be testing. Uh, so the size is good, but we would need that kind of platen above the platen that you could bolt to or weld to. So. A universal frame on top for testing equipment would be really nice. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Derek. No more comments. So I think uh, everybody is ready to go to lunch. It's very understandable. So 
let me take a, a few minutes here to, you know, to on behalf of the NERI and UCSD team, I, I would like to to thank all of you, starting with the speakers and the excellent uh, presentation, the attendees, and for giving us your input and your ideas that we just heard of and uh, the moderators and the scribes who help in the sessions. Thank you very much. We also would like to uh, ask you to please feel free to contact us at any time, those of you who will be preparing uh, proposals. So if you want us, for example, to give you uh, our feedback on feasibility of tests or specimens, feedback on you know, proposed test procedure in your proposal, and we wish you the very best for, 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 for your research proposal, because if you, if you win, we, we also win. Be excited to work with you on, on, on your ideas. And then uh, also ask you, please do not forget again to fill the survey for, for, for this workshop. It will be very useful for us and, and important for NSF. And also, uh, Remember this afternoon, we also have two hours, I think two to three and three to four, where we have what we call office hours with advising on you know, so some of your future proposal or projects that you would like to maybe discuss with us already. And also we would like to ask the, uh, all of you who presented a summary, if you can share your slide with us, that would be, it would be great. And I think that's my list. Uh, Kurosh, do you have maybe anything else that I may have forgotten? Oh, thank you very much, No. Um, about the sharing of the slides, uh, please, if you can, email them to me. I will put my email in the chat once again. Um, and thank you again for attending and participating in our workshop. Maybe the last thing I would like to to give a virtual round of applause to, to Kurosh for his incredible help in organizing this, uh, this workshop and all its logistics. Thank you very much, Kurosh. Thank you, so, my pleasure. That's it, so we uh, adjourned the workshop and uh, thank you all and have a, a great afternoon and hope to see you soon in the future in person, hopefully next time. <laughs> <laughs>